Today's video is about downloading news feeds for use in your code. The news feed I'm going to show will give you the same information that you can find on the Forex Factory calendar, and the code is up to date at the time I'm releasing this video, so there's no guarantee that the URLs won't change or the techniques won't change in the future. To avoid copyright strikes, I won't show the Forex Factory page, and I also won't show where you can find the URL in the Forex Factory web page that I'm going to be using in this video. Now I have the MetaTrader 4 editor open here. There is a small difference between MetaTrader 4 and MetaTrader 5 for this. Um, we will see it, it will come in a later section, and I'll explain then why it's there. And that means I'll also open up the MetaTrader 5 editor later just to compile everything and show you that it works. I've already created two files. Uh, they're just empty files at the moment, uh, just the headings in here. So what I intend to do today is create one file, this inet download, and that will have a class that just handles standard downloads of files from the internet. And then I'll create another class, FF calendar download, which inherits from inet download and will handle the specific files that are downloaded from the Forex factory calendar. So that's the objective for today, to write some classes so that I could download the Forex factory economic calendar. And then I also have two scripts. I've already written them, but I haven't opened them here. Um, there's a newsfeed.mq4 and mq5, because as I said, there's a small difference between the two, and newsfeed2. So newsfeed just uses the inet download, and newsfeed2 uses the FF calendar download. But it downloads the same file from both places. They're just demonstrating slightly different techniques. So I'm going to start with the inet download. Now I've already created the basic outline of the inet download file, so a file called inet download.mqh, and the class name that I'm creating here is C inet download. Basically, this is a class to download files from the internet. And I'm only doing this for very simple cases where the URL is all that's needed to download the file. So there are no prompts, no login, nothing. So this is the very basic file download from the internet. I'm going to want to store some values. So I've got a string value that I'm calling mpath, and this is going to be the path inside the files directory where I will store the result of the download. So the file that gets downloaded will be stored inside this path. This path doesn't include the actual file name. That will come as part of the call to download the file, but this will give the directory where that file is going to be saved. And then there's a timeout. When you make a request on the internet, there is a built-in timeout. Uh, you can reset that in the call to the web request function. And I'm allowing you to set that in the class here so that if you've got a slow responding website, you can increase the timeout for that. Now response will also hold the contents of that file. So assuming you're not downloading extraordinarily large files, they will both be written into a file in this path and I'll also store them in this response variable. And I'll be creating some functions soon that will allow you to get the value of that. That way, when you make a call to download a file, you don't need to read it back from the directory. It will be stored in the directory, but you'll already have it available in memory here. And then error, just in case there's a problem, I'll be storing the value of the error in that variable so that you can interrogate and determine what to do with that. Now then I have constructors. So there's the basic constructor that takes no values. There is a constructor that takes a path, which will be placed into this mpath variable and the timeout. And then of course there's a destructor. You can see here the destructor, I've already put the opening and closing brackets there because there is nothing to do in the destructor and that's all I need. So I don't need to write this function later because I've already included the body of the function here by doing that. And now I have some properties that you can use to retrieve or update the values of these variables if you don't already set them in the constructors. So first there's path. Now, this is my naming convention. A lot of people will prefer to have uh, set path and get path. I'm just calling these both path and I'm relying on the overloading of the functions to determine whether I'm calling the set or the get value. So for path, I've just got the string value being passed in, and all it will do is assign mpath equals value. And for the path that returns a value, the get just returns mpath. Now the reason I'm writing these functions instead of simply making these variables public is that this protects them. 
Now, I have no need to protect them here because you can simply set path and get path. But in a lot of cases, you may want to take action if these values change. And if you simply expose the variables, they can be changed by the calling program and you'll not know anything about that change. So this is just a technique that's quite often used to protect those member variables from being accidentally changed by the calling program by just wrapping them up in get and set functions. And then I have another set of set and get functions. These are for the timeout. So if you don't pass these values in the constructor, or even if you do, they can be changed later by calling these path and timeout functions, and you can retrieve the values as well. Now I also have some read-only properties. So these only have the get values, so that's the error and response. You can't change these, or you shouldn't change these. So all I have is a function to return the values for the error and the response. Um, they are a standard get function. They still simply return the error or return the response, but there's no matching function to change these values. And then I have a single public method, which is download. As I said, this takes a URL, no other values. So everything you might want to include in downloading the file should be included in the URL. There's no opportunity to set cookies or to log in first, anything else. This is simply taking the URL. And the file name, I mentioned that the path is only to the directory where the file is going to be saved. The file name is the actual file name that you want to save. Onto the functions that we have to write here. The first is the default constructor. Remembering that the, the default constructor takes no arguments. So here, uh, as opposed to this constructor, which takes the path and the timeout. But I do need a path and timeout. So if you call the default constructor, I'm passing that on to the next constructor and I'm just setting the path to an empty string and the timeout to 10,000 milliseconds. And now this is the constructor that does take arguments, string path and timeout, and all I'm doing is assigning these to the member variables, but I'm doing it by calling these set functions. And that way, if in future I decide to do something when these values are changed, I've already got that built in here. If I simply said something like mpath equals path, and then later I decided that I wanted to take some action, like maybe clear out any existing files, I would have to do that work in two different places. But by calling the set function here, if I ever make that decision in future, then I just need to change this path set function. And the same with timeout. And now for this basic downloader, there is only one function more to write, and that's the download function. As I said, no arguments, just the URL and the file name where the value is going to be stored. So first I'm initializing values that I'm going to use in this. The file path, which is the complete path using the get function there, uh, concatenated with a double backslash here. Now remember, this, the backslash is a special character, so for a single backslash, which is the path separator, I just need to use a double backslash and then the file name. So that gives me the complete path to the file where I'm going to write the value. Now this download, again, only takes the standard URL, so there are no cookies to worry about, but I do need to have certain values in the call to the web request. So I'm creating a cookie variable, a referrer variable, and I'm just setting those to null because they're not used. I'm setting a timeout value to the response from this function, the get function for timeout. I could simply use that function, but I prefer to capture these values once and reuse them if I need to. There is a char array called data, which is the value that's being sent in the web request. And there is a char array response, which is the data that's returned by the web request. And then there's a string, which are the headers that come back as part of the response. Many of these values are not going to be used, but I need them as part of the web request call. So I'm just declaring these variables here. My next step is just a little bit of cleanup before we make the actual web request. So I'm redefining the M response value to an empty string. And that way, if the web request fails, I've already erased any values here and you don't accidentally use those in your application. And then just reset last error so that if I do get an error, I'll know because there'll be a value in the get last error. Now web request, this is the important one. Web request is an inbuilt function in MetaTrader. It returns an integer value result, which we'll interrogate to determine if this was successful. This is a get request. Get requests have all values inside the URL where post requests send additional values. 
Everything's in the URL. Here is the URL that was passed in. Cookies and referrer are not used, so I'm passing the values in, but they are null. The timeout, which is the length of time that we'll wait before we get a response back from the web server. The data that's being sent, which is empty. I haven't put anything in that data value, so it's not used. This value, which I've hard coded as a zero, is the size of the data. And I know that I have nothing in the data, so I'm just hard coding a zero there. And response at the moment is empty, but it will be filled by the web request with the value that comes back from the web server. And headers will also be filled with values that come back from the server. Now result will tell me if this is successful. So I'm going to test that now. I'm simply saying if result is less than zero, then I'm capturing that value into my error member variable, m error equals get last error. Uh, it's a good idea to capture that once into a value rather than continue to use get last error just to make sure that it doesn't change with anything else that you do in the error handling. And then I'm just going to print that, so using print format. So I have three placeholders, uh, percent %s, which will be the function name, percent %i is an integer value, that will be the error, and then finally percent %s, which is the URL that was used to make the call. That's just what I've chosen to display in the error. If you want to put something else, feel free to do so. Uh, so this will simply say function, error, error number, downloading from URL, and then return false. Remember that this download is a Boolean function. So the return value of false to your application will simply say that you failed. Uh, and then you can interrogate the error to determine what happened and take action. So assuming there was no error here, we have a value in response, but that is a char array, and I want to convert that back to a string. So the inbuilt function char array to string, passing in the response, and I put that straight into my m response member variable. So at this point, I already have everything in memory that I want, but I'm also including the write to file here. So first I'll open the output file. So these are standard functions. Uh, there's a handle, that's an integer value. And I set that with the file open function, passing in the file path. So that's this complete path, which includes the directory and the file name. And then I'm opening the file for writing and I'm opening it as a binary file. I test the handle. So if a handle equals invalid handle, then we were unable to open that file. Could be for a number of reasons. So I capture the error with the get last error again and I'm going to print that value. Again, it's the function, error number, and then opening file, and this will be the path to the file. So that you'll be able to determine from the error message where you tried to open the file and perhaps determine if there might be uh, an invalid character, for example, in the file name, and return false. It's up to your application, I guess, at this point to determine whether you returned false here and there is actually a response value that you can use and you can do that simply by testing M response or use the get function for response because remember that at the beginning of this function, I set that to an empty string. So you can either check whether you're getting an empty string back or check the value of the error to determine whether it's a file error or a web error. So with the file open, all I really need to do is write and then close the file and then return from this function. So I'm using file write array. There's the handle to the file, the response. Now the response is a char array. So file write array will write that char array uh, beginning at position zero for the full size of that char array. Then file flush just makes sure that all the contents that have been written are flushed from memory and out to the file. Then I close the file with file close and then just return true because we've had a successful call to download function. Okay, so that's the complete class that just downloads a file from the internet. Given a URL, it will have the value in the response function here, or you can get the value with the response get function, and it will also have written that file out. So I have this newsfeed.mq4. I've already written this script. Here we have the include orchard newsfeed inet download.mqh. At the beginning of the script, I'm declaring a variable of type cnet download. 
it's a pointer and I'm calling that variable downloader and that's just a new CINet download and I'm already calling that with the values so I'm putting this into the directory Orchard News and I'm setting the timeout to 50,000 and then I've got a boolean value success which tells me if the call to the downloader dot download is successful in that call to the downloader here is the URL and I'll also put this in the description if you want to download the Forex factory calendar this is the URL that will download that calendar in a CSV format and I'm just storing that in a file called calendar.csv this URL is correct at the time that I'm making this video there's no guarantee that it won't change in the future uh, so you may need to do some investigation if you find that this is no longer valid and then I'm setting my response string variable response and I'm using the downloader.response function this is the get function for response so I'm capturing all of that value back into a variable here it has already been written out to the file by simply calling download but rather than go out and read the file again I'm just getting it back from memory uh, I'm setting an error value to zero and then I'm testing if success or if not success so if this has come back as false then I'm simply going to print format here fail to download uh, there's already been a message printed out by the class but I'm just printing it here because this is the point where inside your application you would be running tests to determine what went wrong and then my error I'm capturing the downloader.error using the get function for error. I'm not doing anything with it, just showing how you can retrieve that value. And this else, that means that success is true. So this is a successful result. I'm declaring a string array of lines and another string array called columns. I'm getting integer size, which is string split of response. And I know that in this case, the new line character can be used to split these lines and that will fill the lines array with the lines individual lines from this response so response by this stage has already been converted to a string it comes back in the class as a char array but I'm then setting the m response variable to a string and now I'm splitting that string based on new line characters so I'm getting an array of lines and size tells me how many lines have been returned for this particular URL, the first line is a heading line. So I already know the format. I'm not going to bother with the heading line. I'm going to start from I equals one. So I'm now going to loop through each of these lines, beginning at line number one, because line zero is the heading line. So for integer I equals one, while I is less than size and I plus plus, a standard loop. I'm calling string split again passing lines I so that's each individual line and in this case I'm splitting on a comma I also mentioned in these string splits you can see I've used a single quotation mark here that's because the string split uses a char value here not a string value and to get a char value you enclose that one character in single quotes not double quotes so I'm splitting each line based on the commas into the columns array that I've declared here and then I'm just printing those values uh, and the values that come through from this CSV are the title, the country, date, time, impact, which is generally high, medium, low, or certain others like holiday, uh, the forecast value and the previous value. And then I'm just printing the column values here. I will mention very quickly, it's not going to matter too much for this demonstration, but when I split lines or when I split the entire response into lines the terminator is actually a new line carriage return so by splitting based on the new line alone there will be a carriage return left at the end of each of these lines a backslash r uh, you can take the trouble to remove that if you like for this demonstration it doesn't matter but when I call the string split I need to split on a single character so I've just chosen the new line there as the split character um, and once it's been through this, and if I run it, it will simply print out every line in this response. Then I just delete the downloader and finished. Let me compile that to make sure that I don't have an error here. That all compiled. If I go back to MetaTrader 4 now, I can actually run that, and you'll see in the Experts tab all of these values being printed.
Now I'm here in MetaTrader 4. Here is the newsfeed script that I've written. I'm going to run that and you should see an error straight away. And here is the error failed to download. So there's one step that you need to follow. If we go to Tools, Options, and here in the Expert Advisors tab of Options, there is this checkbox, Allow Web Request for Listed URL. In order to make a call, I need to make sure that the URL that I'm calling, and in this case it's https colon slash slash nfs.fareconomy.media, is included in this list. Let me do that. And I'll just clear this again. And now when I run, that's been successful. And you can see here, I've all the lines that have come through in the economic calendar from Forex Factory. I will mention a second thing while we're here. Where are we? Back to web request. I'm running this in a script. Web request can only be called by a script or an expert. You can't use this in an indicator. So if you do want to write an indicator that is using some values back from web request, then you will need to perhaps create an expert advisor that periodically calls web request to download to this known file name. And then in your indicator, you can read values from that file. But from an indicator, you cannot call web request. So now we'll move on to the FF calendar download. You can see that in the news feed, I have downloaded directly from the fareconomy.media. That's the calendar used by Forex Factory. What I want to do in the FF calendar download is encapsulate that so that this class handles downloading specifically from Forex Factory. And so in the header of this FF calendar download, I already have an include of INET download because I'm inheriting from that. I don't need to rewrite all of the download code again. So this class is called CFF calendar download. It's inheriting from CINET download and it's public. That means that the public methods in CINET download will also be public in CFF calendar download without me having to rewrite them. So as part of making this a specific download for the Forex Factory calendar, I'm actually going to create a structure that will hold the values from those columns. The title and country are fairly obvious. In the download CSV file, there are actually two columns, a date and a time column. I'm going to combine those into a single date time. So I just have one value here. And then there's the impact, the forecast and the previous. The protected and public methods and variables that I had in CINET download are still available here in CFF calendar download. I do have an additional function that I need for CFF calendar download. And I'm making that protected because it's not going to be called from the outside. And that's simply parse response which will take that response variable that we get back and split it up into this SFF event structure. Now I'm recreating the constructors here. It's just not bad practice. So there's the default constructor. And all I'm doing there with this colon CINet download is passing that default constructor onto this default constructor. Now the reason I'm doing that rather than just handle it myself, if I make any changes in this default constructor, and remember all that did was to fill in default values for path and timeout. But if I change that, then everything is wrapped up inside the constructor for CINet download. So simply, if I call CFF calendar download with the default constructor, I'm just going to call the parent constructor. And then I have the constructors with arguments and the same thing here. I'm just calling the parent constructor of CINet download, passing on that path and timeout because I have nothing additional that I want to do here. And then the destructor again, nothing here. I have no additional get and set properties. I've left the uh, comment here, but I don't need to rewrite those get and set properties for path and timeout because they're already in the parent class. I do have two additional read only properties. So there is an array of SFF events. So that's the structure here, SFF event. I have an array of those, which I'm just calling events. So it's an array here and then an integer variable count. So this is just a variable and I am just making the variable available I know I said that there are practices for using get and set, but in this case, I just didn't worry about it. So I'm just declaring the count variable as public so you can access that and it will have the number of values that come back 
in the response. And then I also have a download function because this has different arguments. It just has the file name. Remember that this class is specifically to download from Forex Factory or from the Fair Economy website. So I don't need to pass the URL, that's going to be fixed for this particular class. And that's why I just have a download function here that just takes the file name. So with that, I just need to write the download function and the pass response function. So the download function just takes the file name and the first difference to the parent download function Because I have this array of events, I need to resize that to zero before I begin. So if something goes wrong, I already have cleared out the events array. And now I can leverage the download function from the parent. So this is the same URL that you saw in my example script. I'm just embedding that in a URL variable here. Bool result equals and then CINet download colon colon download. So CINet download is the name of the parent. So this is forcing me to call the parent download, passing that URL that I've just declared and the file name that was passed into this function. So I'm reusing the function from the parent rather than rewrite everything here. And then I'm simply saying if not result, so if that returned false, then I just return false. And that gets me out of this function straight away without doing any more. And you can still interrogate this from the application to get the error value and determine anything else that you need to know what might have gone wrong. If I get to this point, all I need to do is parse the values using that parse response function. So parse response and then return true. So the parse response function now. Now you'll recognize some of this from the earlier script. I have an array of lines, an array of columns. I'm getting an integer value of size using string split on that response for the new line character and putting that into lines. And the same thing holds here. These lines are still going to have a carriage return character because this split on the new line removes the new lines in between, but leaves that carriage return because it's not specified here. Now, remembering size includes the heading line. So I'm setting the count variable. That's the one that is publicly available here. Count to size minus one. So now count has the actual number of data lines that have been returned. Now I can resize that events array to the size of count. I'm declaring two arrays that I'm going to be using uh, for working values when I'm putting the date time together. Remember the date and time are two different columns. I need to put them together. So I have two working variables here and they're both string arrays, date parts and time parts. And then the standard loop for int i equals zero while i is less than count i plus plus. And this is where we see differences between MetaTrader 4 and MetaTrader 5. I'm just using the if def underscore underscore mql4 underscore underscore. So that's a compiler macro that's inserted and I know that I'm compiling this under MetaTrader 4 here. And to get the columns, I'm using string split and splitting on that comma. But remember I have this carriage return in here and possibly extra spaces or white space at the beginning and end. So I'm using string trim right. I'm addressing lines I plus one. So remember lines, the first line is the heading and I'm beginning with I equals zero. So I actually want to begin at line number one. So I'm always going to be referring to I plus one. String trim right will remove spaces, carriage returns, tabs from the right-hand side of the string. I'm passing that into string trim left, which does the same on the left-hand side of the string. And then I'm calling string split. So this will remove that carriage return that's been left over in each line. And I'm passing all of that into columns. For MetaTrader 5, there's only a slight difference. In MetaTrader 4, the string trim right function returned a string that was trimmed, and so did the string trim left. In MetaTrader 5, string trim right actually updates the value that's been passed in, and string trim left does the same. So if you tried to compile this in MetaTrader 5, it will fail. And in MetaTrader 4, this will compile, but you won't get a result. So 
I'm calling string trim right first on that value and that will update lines I plus one. Then again with string trim left and then finally the string split on that lines I plus one. Some of the values that have come back are just strings so I can just store those straight away. So the title, the country and the impact are just strings. So I simply grab the values from columns. Zero is the title, one is the country and four is the impact and store those in the events array row I, not I plus one. So the events will only have values, not the headings. And now I get to the date and time and this is a little bit more complex. So the date and time are stored in separate columns and they're not stored in the same format of date and time that MetaTrader wants to understand. So first I'm going to break up the date and it's stored in an mm-dd-yy format and the time is stored in hh colon mm with am slash pm where MetaTrader prefers a 24 hour time and MetaTrader prefers dates as yyyy.mm.dd. So first just using string split Columns 2 is the date, so I'm, str I'm splitting that on a dash and putting that into the date parts array. This is why I declared date parts here and time parts. So I split that to date parts and the time I'm splitting on a colon into time parts. So at this stage, the second value of time parts or the second cell in the array will contain AM or PM. So Time parts 0 will be hours and time parts 1 will be minutes AM PM. So there's a little bit more work to do on these before I can convert this into a MetaTrader date time. Now the first thing is that in a 12 hour clock I need to remove 12. So 12 AM would be 0 on a 24 hour clock and 12 PM would still be 12 but we'll get to that in a moment. So if the hour from time parts is 12, and remember this is still a string time parts, it's not an integer yet. If that's a 12, then I want to make it a zero. So it's a very simple, if time parts zero is equal to 12, then time parts zero equals zero, zero, strings. Now that I've eliminated the 12, I just need to determine if we're in AM or PM and simply add 12 hours to whatever I have in the hours part if we're in PM. So I'm just testing the first character of the minutes section. So remember that time parts one will contain minutes and AM or PM. So I'm testing time parts one, which is the minutes section and the third character. So characters are counting begins at zero. So zero, one, two, character number two for one character. If that's a P, then I'm PM. If not, then it's AM. And if it's PM, then I simply want to add 12 to the hours. So first I'm converting the string hours to an integer. So string to integer of time parts zero gives me the number of hours, adding 12 to that, and then I'm converting it back to a string because time parts is a string array using integer to string. But at this stage, I still have AM or PM at the end of time parts one. And I just happen to know that in this file, the minutes are always two digits. It's uh, either zero, zero, it's always zero padded. So I'm simply taking the first two characters using string substra, time parts one, beginning at zero for two characters. So now all the hard work's done, I just need to join that back together and then convert that string into a date time. And that's simple concatenation. I've declared a variable called time string. So date parts two is the year plus dot. Date parts zero is the month plus another dot. And date parts one is the days. A space to separate the date from the time. And then time parts zero is hours colon time parts one is minutes. And then I can simply say events i dot time equals string to time of that time string. And now there's just the forecast and previous left.
Now you may want to store these as values, so as doubles, but depending what the forecast, depending what the event is, the forecast and previous can be in many different formats. So I felt it best at this stage just to store them as strings. You can interrogate these depending on the event type and decide whether you want to convert them to numbers. So some of them have percentages. That's easy enough to convert. Just find the percent and divide by 100. Uh, some are terminated with a K, M, or a B for thousands, millions, or billions. Again, that's easy to convert. But some have greater than a value or less than a value. And then you need to determine what you want to do with that. And some might be for voting. And they generally come back with yes, no, and abstain values like so. Uh, so I felt it easier at this stage just to store these as a string and then just finish that function. So let me just check that this compiles. So this will just do a syntax check on it. No errors there. And now I'll go to the newsfeed 2mq 4 which I've already written. newsfeed 2mq 4 Here I'm including Orchard Newsfeed FF Calendar download.mqh. So I've changed my object it's a type CFF calendar download, downloader, new CFF calendar download. These arguments are the same. I'm still storing it in Orchard News with a 50,000 timeout. I'm still getting my Boolean success value by calling download, but here I've only got a single value, which is calendar.csv. If I want to, I can still call download with the URL and the file name, and that will call the download function from the parent class, so I won't get any of the parsing done. So this is useful if I want to download both the Forex Factory calendar and just general files from the web and still declaring an error variable. And this is much the same. If not success, then I'm going to print failed to download and capture the error, which I have nothing to do with that yet, but I'm just capturing it. And in the else statement, so I've had a successful download. I still have a for loop for int i equals zero while i is less than downloader.count. So this is the public variable that we created in downloader, I++. So I'm going to be looping through all of the events. And then I'm just calling the print format. But here I've just got title, country, and time. So previously I had date and time because they were separate columns. Time, impact, forecast, and previous. And then I have this events public variable available in downloader. So downloader.eventsi.title, country, I'm using time to string to convert the time from the events and then impact forecast and previous. So I'll get very similar results coming back, but everything has already been parsed into this events array. And then just delete downloader. Let me compile that. That compiled successfully. Let's just go over to MetaTrader 4. Now, before I run that news feed too, because I forgot to show earlier, I'm going to go to file open data folder and because I'm using MetaTrader 4 at the moment under MQL4 files orchard news so remember I said store this in orchard news and here is calendar.csv which I think I've set to open up with notepad at the moment uh, so we can see here this is the heading line and then each of the lines after that as comma separated variables so you can see that that's downloaded I'll just delete that so that you can see that it does download again And I'll clear this. And now I'll run newsfeed2. There we go. So newsfeed2. I'm getting title, country. The time now is coming back as a single value because I've converted that from the two date and times. Impact, forecast, and previous. Some lines have no forecast and previous. That's why you're seeing that here. Others do. And you can see here an example. This one's 712K previous 708k uh, here's one with a percentage and so on and if I just go back open data folder mql4 files orchard news there's the file again it should be the same file as before because we're getting the same values back so that's downloaded the forex factory calendar just remember that you can't call this from an indicator. You have to call it from an expert or a script. And I did say that there's a difference between MetaTrader 4 and MetaTrader 5, which I've already shown in the code. So I'm just going to close down MetaTrader 4, open MetaTrader 5, and run the same thing there.
So I have the MetaTrader 5 editor open now. I've already opened my scripts, newsfeed.mq5 and newsfeed2.mq5. These are actually the same scripts that I had for MetaTrader 4. I've just renamed the files as MQ5, just changed this comment. Everything else in here is the same as I had for MetaTrader 4. The only difference between MetaTrader 4 and 5 that I demonstrated was the conditional compilation. Uh, I will just show you one more thing. If I open this FF Calendar download, and I mentioned this as I was going through the code. Where is it? Here. C inet download colon colon. In MetaTrader 4, you can leave that out and everything will be fine. In MetaTrader 5, this will issue a warning and the warning tells you that this behavior will be deprecated in the future. And the behavior they're talking about is the default to call the parent function. So this simply forces the parent function to be called and that's exactly what I want anyway. This compiles in both MetaTrader 4 and MetaTrader 5 without a problem. So it's not bad practice to say that you're trying to call the parent download function because then if you ever do include a download that has the same arguments, it's very clear to the compiler that you're calling the parent class and not just calling the download function in the current class. So that's the only other difference between MetaTrader 4 and 5 and the two are compatible as long as you follow this syntax. Apart from that, these are really just conditional compilation. Let me go to newsfeed.mq5 and compile that. And that's successful. Newsfeed2, I'll compile that. Also successful. So now I'll go to MetaTrader 5 and I'll run both of these to demonstrate. So MetaTrader 5, I'm setting the options the same as MetaTrader 4. Expert Advisors tab, allow web request for listed URL, https colon slash slash nfs.fareconomy.media. You'll need to do that for any URL that you're going to use in web request. And now I will just run news feed. Same values as before. I'll clear that and I'll run news feed two. And similar values, but here I've just joined the date and time together. So working both for MetaTrader 4 and MetaTrader 5. That's all I have for today. If you found this useful, remember to click the like button. And if you want to see more of our videos, click subscribe. And then if you click the bell icon, you'll be notified when we do release new videos. Thank you for watching.